Today, we have Dr. Stephen Criswell, who is the uh, Director of Native American Studies. I feel like he does not need an introduction to this crowd. Um, you'll remember last year or the year before, he talked about Christmas deco yard decorations. And as a folklorist, he kind of has a, a neat spin on the things that we do. And uh, so today, he'll be talking about Halloween. It's nothing to be scared of. Stephen Criswell. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chris. I'm gonna to have to step off the camera yeah, for a second. It is. This, <laughs> I do love this. <laughs> I'm, I'm joined today by the Thunderbird, uh, who will be keeping an eye on me. Uh, I'm gonna to to step off camera for a second because since we're talking about Halloween, here I'm gonna put it on the camera. What we have here. So, um, if you're watching on the on, if you're streaming this, uh, feel free to have your own candy. I'm gonna pass this out here. So, here we go. No tricks needed in the street. Pass this around. Now, if you're on a diet, um, if you're watching your sugar, my uh, mother used to explain to me that if you break it in half and eat the half separately, it has half the calories. Also, if no one sees you eat it, it has no calories. So, um, well, thank y'all for, for having me back uh, for Lunch and Learn. Thank you, Chris, for that that introduction. Um, yeah, I'm, I, I am by training a folklorist. And one of the things that we study um, is or are uh, festivals, celebrations, holidays, and, and the way uh, communities and individuals um, celebrate those those uh, those uh, times of year and all of the things that go with it, the the uh, regalia, costuming, whatever it might be, foods that go with it, uh, activities, and so forth. And so Halloween, of course, fits right into that. Um, I, I started this lecture with my students a while back partly because I'm, I've always been a big fan of Halloween. I, I really like Halloween. Um, it, it doesn't have, to me, it doesn't have the uh, stress that many of the ho other holidays have when Thanksgiving cooking and Christmas gifts and all that sort of thing. Um, so it's really just a time of, of fun. Um, and part of that fun is being scared, which is, which is oh, it's safe, safely scared, which is always fun. Um, but I noticed a few years ago, the Halloween seemed to be threatened, and I'll, I'll mention this at the end of the talk, but um, it, it got me uh, thinking about how probably a lot of people don't know where Halloween comes from. We hear, we hear all sorts of things. Halloween is not uh, Satan's birthday. It turns out that is December 11th or 17th, depending on who you ask. Apparently, the um, king of Sweden decreed that at one point, that, and I believe he said it on December 17th. So, I personally don't celebrate the devil's birthday, but you know, if you want to, that's that's fine. That's your choice. <laughs> but Halloween is is not. However, uh, Halloween is a uh, a religious holiday, but it's a Christian holiday, more or less. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the the origins of Halloween and the significance of it, and uh, uh, sort of how it exists today. So let's let's go ahead and talk um, about where Halloween comes from. So the origins are one of the origins uh, of Halloween. Uh, goes back to the Celts of ancient Europe. Uh, the Celts were spread across Western Europe and, of course, eventually um, limited more or less to the tiny spot of Brittany in France, um, Scotland, uh, Wales, and, um, and Ireland. Um, but before that, they were, of course, spread across much of Europe. And, of course, they weren't Christians. Uh, no one in Europe was at, that, at this point. Um, and the Celts had a New Year's Day festival, not January 1st, but November 1st, and it marked the beginning of the winter festival of Samhain, it's spelled like Samhain, but in, in Gaelic, I've been told it's pronounced Samhain. Um, and this was their, their new year. It was the mark of the, of the end of the year and the beginning of the new year. If you think about how the days are getting shorter now, uh, we're getting into a darker time. And for the Celts, this was, in their minds, the beginning of things. Things would get dark and then they would get light again. And they held this festival, this winter festival, Samhain, and in some ways like the harvest festivals that we still see today, uh, but in other ways with a, a pre-Christian religious element to it. Samhain was the beginning and ending of the annual cycle, uh, the, the yearly cycle of, of spring, summer, winter, and fall, or I guess in this case, winter, spring, summer, fall. Uh, it was the most significant Celtic festival. At Samhain, ghosts of the dead mingled with the living. So the idea was that this night was a time when the spirits, the ancestors, could come back among the living, come back and visit with us. And this is not a, a, a concept limited, of course, to the ancient Celts. We have people all around the world who believe there's a certain time of year or a certain place where the spirits of the ancestors, the spirits of the dead, can, can communicate with us, can come back uh, in one form or another. 
Um, not so much you know, zombies or, or ghosts, you know, white sheeted ghosts, but just the spirits of the ancestors. At Samhain, the ghosts of the dead mingle with the living and people gathered to sacrifice animals, fruits and vegetables and to light bonfires or bone fires. If you're not familiar with it, the origin of the word bonfire, not it's not French um, good fire, but it's bone, bone as in bone. So it's bone fire, fire of bones uh, in honor of the dead and to aid them on their journey and to keep them away from the living as well, because you know, the, the Celts wanted to communicate with the ancestors, um, but they wanted to play it safe. And very often the the, 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 the spirits of the dead were thought to um, deliver messages and prophecies and so forth to the to the priests of the Celts, the Druids, who we'll talk a little bit more about. But they would the, the ancestors would advise the living. So so the the ghosts in this case, the undead, were not uh, uh, dangerous, were not malicious. Um, but they still were spirits, so you want to you want to be careful with them. At Samhain time, it was a day when all manner of mysterious creatures, ghosts, fairies, demons, and so forth, could and the spirits of the ancestors could freely travel among the world of mortals. In attempts to keep the spirits away, the Celts lit the bonfires, as I mentioned earlier. They set out illuminated skulls or imitation skulls. And in the case of of uh, Ireland, Scotland, the Celtic world, uh, these were often turnips, right? very large turnips. Of course, they didn't carve pumpkins because they didn't have pumpkins, right? Pumpkins are an American uh, uh, fruit, fruit, melon, I guess. Um, and they even dressed themselves up to look scarier than the spirits, because if you want to scare an scare a, a evil spirit away or a dangerous spirit away, you want to dress worse than one, you want to be scarier than it is. And to keep these spirits from making mischief, they'd put out food uh, for them to partake in. And sometimes those in costumes would steal these treats. So you can see where this ended up going. So the Celts of the British Isles, eventually most of the Celts of Europe were scattered, assimilated into other communities or migrated west to the British Isles. In Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and for a brief period of time before the coming of the Anglo-Saxons, England became the homeland, homeland of the Celts. So, before uh, Christianity arrives in the British Isles, we have the Romans. And the Romans, of course, didn't conquer all of the British Isles. They didn't conquer Ireland. They, they failed at Scotland, but they got much of, of England. And their influence and their culture spread across Europe as well, and often mingled with the, uh, the local culture. And in the case of the, uh, of the Romans, there were two significant events that, that probably uh, lent their influence to modern Halloween. Uh, one is a, a celebration called Ferelia, uh, which was a day to honor the Roman god of the dead, Ferelia. Um, the other was the festival of Pomona, uh, who was the goddess of fruit and uh, harvest and so forth. Um, uh, Pomona uh, related to, to pom, right, the French word for, for apple, um, because the symbol for Pomona was an apple possibly where we get the idea of bobbing for apples in Halloween as well. So the apple makes its appearance uh, sometime after 43 AD as, as the Romans enter into Europe. Um, but as uh, Rome became the Holy, Holy Roman Empire, as Europe became more and more uh, Christian, uh, Christianized, converted, um, the Celts fell under this, this um, conversion as well. Before the first millennium of the Common Era, the Celts practiced a pantheistic uh, religious tradition. They, they had many multiple gods, and they were led by a priestly caste known as the Druids, right? For, made famous by uh, Spinal Tap, if you're familiar with that, uh, with that film. And so these, these Druids, as I mentioned, would, would often at Samhain, they would commune with the dead to get, get um, prophecy, guidance, advice, and so forth. But the Celts became Christianized. And of course, most famously, through the work of St. Patrick. In the 400s, a missionary named Patrick was sent to Ireland to assist Christians in the region to convert the quote-unquote pagans. Uh, this is St. Patrick, who was historically known for uh, driving the snakes out of Ireland. Of course, there never were any snakes in Ireland in the post-glacial era. Perhaps, I, I've heard actually heard Chief Harris here uh, mentioning that perhaps that was a symbolic reference to Patrick driving out the, the non-Christians, the pagans driving out the old religions, the religion of the serpent, uh, which were mostly matriarchal religions, which is a whole other, other discussion. But um, and there's also a question of whether there was one Patrick. This may have been multiple people as well. But what we do know is, is beginning around the, 14, the 400s, we start seeing Christianity spread far and wide, particularly in the Celtic world. And 60 years later, uh, St. Columbshiel or Columba, 
uh, helped develop Christianity in Scotland. So we see the British Isles, the Celtic world becoming becoming Christianized, being converted. Patrick and Colin Shill were successful in part because they incorporated local traditions into Christian worship. For example, Patrick encouraged the building of bonfires at Easter. And you still see in America, there are a few communities at Easter time that, that will build bonfires. This, this tradition gets carried over. Um, but they were no longer bone fires for the ancestors. They were now um, fires to, to show light, to show the light that was coming Easter morning, the light and the darkness, the birth of Christ, etc. And what we see begin is a blending of Christianity and paganism, the pre-Christian um, religious traditions of Europe, and particularly in this case, the Celts, began blending with Christianity. And in 601, Pope Gregory I issued an edict on native beliefs and customs. He instructed missionaries to use local traditions. So if a group of people worshiped a tree, rather than cut it down and burn it and, and pour holy water on it and so forth, he advised them to consecrate it to Christ and allow its continued worship. Right. So to the point where they uh, not only would they they go out and uh, um, worship these trees and these trees became consecrated to Christ. They put candles on them to to celebrate them. They put lights on them. They cut them down. They brought them to the house. So as a side thing, the earliest Christmas trees, the Germans would, would the old Germans would cut them down, bring them into the house and put candles on them. dry <laughs> trees in the house. Okay, that just seemed like a recipe for disaster. But um <laughs> I guess you would be to told you were cursed, I guess, if that happened. But uh, church holy days were purposely set to coincide with native hol uh, uh, holy, uh, holy days. Excuse me. Christmas was assigned the arbitrary date of December 25th because it corresponded with uh, midwinter religious tradition. So yeah, we, we celebrate Christmas. And scholars will tell you that uh, according to, you know, uh, even the biblical accounts, Christ would have been born in, in the spring, right? The shepherds were out with their flock. And the, the climate wasn't that different there than here. Um, but December 25th became the church's designation for this is when we're going to celebrate the birth of Christ and all that goes with it. Um, Samhain, with its emphasis on the supernatural, was a little more difficult to replace because it was more tightly connected to the pre-Christian beliefs of the Celts. But it began, it began to, uh, th those beliefs began to be shaped by missionaries, by the church itself, so that the Celtic underworld, uh, which was not a place of eternal punishment, it was just where people went when they died, but it became identified with the Christian hell. A Christian feast for all saints was assigned to November 1st as a substitute for Samhain. We still celebrate All Saints Day today. The holiday honored all Christian saints, the holy dead, the holy. And the eve before that, of course, was all holy people's eve or all hallows eve traditional celtic deities diminished in status so that the very powerful uh godlike on those fairies became the fairies that we think about today became tinkerbell and so forth or leprechauns uh, of more recent traditions while the powers of gods and goddesses became associated with the saints so that the goddess bridget became saint bridget however the power of sawa never fully died out and the idea of the dead returning was too strong and too significant um, to, and too primal to be co uh, covered over that easily. So the church backed up and tried again. The church tried a second time to supplant Samhain with another Christian feast, the day, uh, another feast day in the ninth century on December 2nd, which became All Souls Day, a day for when the living prayed for the souls of the dead. Uh, and again, in a few, com in a few communities in, in the United States, you can still find celebrations of All Souls Days, All Saints Day, um, where I went to college in South Louisiana, uh, November 1st, uh, families would go out into the uh, graveyards and wash tombs, and they would have picnics out in the graveyard and talk about the, the ancestor, the, the person who had died, and they would, they would bring out new flowers, wash the tombs, and so forth, um, and it became a, a day of remembrance, and this, this begins in the ninth century, but these vestiges of Samhain don't fade away. They, they keep, they keep uh, appearing, reappearing, and, and they're 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 sustained by the practitioners um, in these in these uh, geographical regions. So the celebrations of All Saints Day or All Hallows Day or Holy Day continued the ancient Celtic traditions. The evening prior to the feast day was most intense, and that would be the Eve, All Hallows Eve, or Hallow Evening, or of course today Halloween. The All Hallows Eve traditions continued the idea of the wandering dead, but now they were thought to be evil folk, and monsters, and scary creatures. So you've got these evil spirits wandering around. 
you don't want them bothering you. You don't want them uh, possessing people. You don't want them getting into your house. So they would leave gifts outside still for the dead to appease them. Bonfires were still lit. Scary costumes were still worn. And people made as much noise as possible to scare away the evil spirits. Around All Souls Day, the custom of souling sprang up. Beggars would go from house to house, particularly the houses of the wealthy, to beg for treats known as soul cakes. So in exchange for a cake, the beggar agreed to pray for your soul. So not so much trick or treat, but I guess uh, uh, prayer and treat, maybe. A uh, cake would be offered to the beggar in exchange for prayer for a departed family member. Uh, so we see the beginnings of this exchange of, of a confection um, from, from a visitor to the house around this time. The souling tradition blended with mumming traditions. Uh, some of you might be familiar with, with the mumming traditions, like the Mummers Parade in Philadelphia, but it's an old, old medieval, maybe even earlier tradition. Some say it goes back to even to uh, ancient Egypt. But mummers were groups of amateur performers who would travel around the holidays to, or travel around the villages during the holidays and perform comedy skits and mini dramas in exchange for food and drink during the time when there was no uh, drama in, the, in the, the so-called dark ages of Europe, the mummers were still out doing these little plays, keeping the idea of theater alive. Uh, and they would do these little performances in exchange for, for uh, treats. Selfish residents, people who didn't give them a treat, were often punished with a trick. And we still see, see elements of this as well. So you can't talk about Halloween without talking about the jack-o'-lantern. And I mentioned earlier, the ancient Celts kept skulls or fake skulls carved out of turnips around their bonfires. Christianized Celts hollowed, hollowed out turnips and carved scary faces on them to drive away evil spirits. In America, immigrants used pumpkins. The carved turnips became associated with the tale of a soul who was too bad for heaven and too tricky for hell. So the most, uh, the, the most common story is that of Stingy Jack. And so Stingy Jack was a, um, a trickster character. He was a, a very clever, um, troublemaking fellow. And um, his, the, the, his favorite dupe, the favorite butt of his tricks was Satan. He loved playing tricks on the devil. And so, for, for example, one time he, um, he got the devil mad at him, which isn't easy, you know, it isn't hard to do, but he got the devil mad at him. The devil was chasing him and he, and, uh, uh, no, it's the reverse way. He was chasing the devil. That's what it was. He was chasing the devil um, and he chased the devil up a tree and he surrounded the tree with crosses so the devil can't come around crosses so he was stuck up in the tree. Uh, but the one that generally gets associated with the jack-o'-lantern story is that um, Jack owed a lot of money to some villagers and they were running him out of town. So he was running out of town and who does he run into? Of course, his old friend, the devil. And he says, say, you got to help me out here. I've got these villagers after me. I got a great idea for a trick that we can pull on them and, and you'll love it. And Satan says, all right, I'm always down for a trick. And Jack says, all right, turn yourself into a coin. I'm going to take you as a coin because the devil can turn himself into anything. Turns him into a coin, turns himself into a coin. Jack says, turn yourself into a coin. I'm going to put you in my pocket. I'm going to take you back to the village. And I'm going to give you to all those people I owe money to. And I'm going to say, look, I only have this one very expensive coin. You guys take this, figure it out. But that's going to pay my debts. So then you change yourself into something else and disappear. And the coin's going to be gone. And while the villagers are trying to figure out how to break this up and pay off all the debts with it and cash it in and that sort of thing, it's going to be missing. They're going to assume one of them stole it. And they're all going to fight with each other. And you know, devil, how much you love people fighting each other. You love the chaos. And the devil says, that's a good plan. I like that. That's evil. I like evil. And so he turns himself into a coin. Jack picks up the coin, puts it in his pocket, just happens to have a cross in his pocket as well. So he's trapped him. And he keeps him there for a while. And, and finally, I guess the devil in coin form is, is begging for, for release. And Jack finally says, all right, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to let you go, devil but you have to promise you will never take my soul. That was, all right, all right, I'm a man of my word. Yeah, I made, you know, made this promise during the fiddle contest. I'll keep my word. So he promises never to, to take Jack's soul. Well, Jack eventually dies, as we all do. So Jack dies, he goes up to heaven. St. Peter says, oh, no, Jack, you're not coming here. No, you were bad, dude. You go downstairs. He goes down to hell and the devil says, I, I can't take you. I promised you I wouldn't take you. Jack says, well, what am I supposed to do? And the devil says, well, it looks like you're just going to have to wander the earth forever. Jack says, well, it, it gets dark. I'm going to get lost. I'm going to, what am I going to do? And Dale says, I don't know. Here, take this. And he throws him a hot coal. And Jack takes the coal and bounces around. And he says, I had to put it in something. And he throws it into a hollowed out turnip. He carries that turnip around to light his way. And that is the origin of the jack o lantern yeah. So many cultures have practiced rituals and held festivals focused on honoring and appeasing the spirits of the dead. 
and many hold harvest festivals in the autumn. In the Western Hemisphere, Native Americans uh, have held and still hold today many feasts and celebrations for ancestral spirits, and some of these do occur uh, in the in the autumn season. In uh, Latin America, uh, in the in the uh, Latin world, South America, Central America, particularly in Mexico, um, we see the celebration of the Day of the Dead, El Dia de los Muertos. Um, often Day of the Dead is referred to as Mexican Halloween. It's not. They have different origins. The Aztecs held feasts in the dead for the dead in the autumn, and in Mexico, Catholicism merged with local indigenous beliefs, and in the case of the Day of the Dead, All Souls Day and All Saints Days merged with native rituals for and beliefs about the dead, creating a uniquely Mexican holiday, which has spread through much of the Latin uh, world and, and into the United States as well. Um, but it comes from an Aztec tradition that blended with Catholicism to create this uh, syncretic um, tradition, whereas we see a parallel but not the same uh, effect or event in, in the Celtic world, but in, in the way that the Irish and Scottish uh, traditions blended with Catholicism and the All Souls Day and All Saints Day traditions in Europe, in Mexico, uh, they blended with the Aztec tradition so that we have all of these uh, wonderful images from, from Day of the Dead celebrations. But in the United States, Halloween wasn't celebrated uh, in the early days of the United States for the most part. The Puritans, the Puritans refused to celebrate All Souls Day and All Saints Day, and and most the Puritans just weren't a lot of fun, really. They just didn't celebrate much at all. Um, the, the the Presbyterians weren't big fans of Halloween. The Catholic Church, though, did continue, um, or Catholics who came to the United States did continue All Souls Day, All Saints Day, and again in in areas that have high concentrations of of Catholic um, descendants of Catholic immigrants, um, you see some of these traditions in 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 their earlier forms, like I mentioned the the bonfires earlier. But of course, in the 19th century, we had waves and waves of immigrants from Ireland as well as Scotland and England who brought Halloween customs to the United States. In the 19th century, which is um, one of the first times we see the, the term um, jack-o'-lantern in print, if I'm not mistaken, in the 19th century, um, the festival that became Halloween increased in popularity, particularly with the arrival of the large waves of Irish immigrants coming from the, the famine and, and other issues in, in Ireland. And they brought with them their, their traditions and their culture and it caught on and spread across the United States. Other ethnic groups adopted the Celtic customs and blended them with their own. Uh, many Europeans found parallels between Halloween and Carnival or Mardi Gras. Now, of course, two different times of the year, but in some ways, Mardi Gras and Halloween bookend the, the winter time in some ways, or bookend at least the, the, the autumn time. German and Scandinavian immigrants saw parallels with Vospersnacht or Witches' Night when bonfires would be lit to keep witches away. So these, these um, aspects of Halloween, or sort of one, something over here, something over there, but particularly when they come to America, where, we, where our cultures tend to get blended um, together to sort of this, this mass culture, um, you know, this element of German culture and this element of Irish culture and this element of, of uh, French Catholic culture all sort of blend together. And we start seeing modern Halloween, where we continue to have customs such as costuming and trick-or-treating, which we can uh, uh, harken back to the, the souling uh, tradition. Carving and displaying jack-o'-lanterns, uh, of course, we don't use turnips anymore. Um, and in certain regions, regional bonfire, or I'm sorry, certain regions building bonfires um, is one of the traditions that's been maintained. Other customs and imagery harken back to Samhain and other traditions, apple bobbing, as I mentioned earlier, decorating with orange and black, which, which were colors that were associated with Samhain. Uh, black cats and witches, all of that element, ghosts, etc., carried over into today. We think about it and as a folklorist, uh, one of the things that I'm interested in is, is why or what function uh, does this serve? Why do we celebrate Halloween. Why have we celebrated Halloween? And despite the fact that it's gone from a, um, a spiritual, religious, pre-Christian um, you know, holy day to a uh, Christian, Catholic holy day to a fairly secular holiday today, but it still continues. And, and traditions survive as long as they're serving a purpose, as long as people keep doing things uh, because they're getting something out of it. Um, and in the case of Samhain and then later Halloween, we're looking at rites of passage. Um, so just 
sort of a quick um, anthropology lesson here. Uh, rituals are rites of passage. If we uh, look at the work of Arnold van Gennep, um, they involve three stages, separation, liminality, and reincorporation. I always use a, a wedding uh, with my students for this because you think about a wedding ceremony. There is a separation. The, the, the bride and groom, groom and groom, bride and bride, the two who are getting married um, are separated. They, they take a step forward away from, from so if we're having a wedding up here, they would come forward. You know, saying I was, if I were the uh, the priest, the, the celebrant, um, they're separated. And then there's a brief period where they are bride and groom, right? Or they are they are fiancés. That's a that's a brief. You can't be a fiancé forever. You can't be a bride and groom forever. Eventually, you're going to be a husband and wife, and just, you're going to get exhausted. But <laughs> you, that moment, though, you are something else. You are out of time, and it's a it's a tricky time. Anything can happen. Somebody can stand up and say, "I object." The bride can run away, you know, you base this on, on Julie Roberts movies. Um, anything can happen. But the ceremony is complete and the celebrant turns the, the uh, married couple to the, to the audience, to the congregation, um, and announces their marriage. They two have become one. They have changed, right? So they're separated. There's this in-between time and things go back to, uh, or things are, are, are changed in the case of a rite. Rites are transformational. The boy becomes a man. The bride and groom become one. The soul is released from the body. There is the separation, the liminal period, reincorporation, which leads to change. Something different has occurred. During that liminal time, that time out of time, transformation occurs. Samhain was, was a ritual in this sense because it was a strange time. It was that, that one day when the, the veil was lifted and the ancestors, the spirits, the, the dead could come back commune with the living, and at least in the, in the case of the Druids, could advise them, could give them prophecy, and the next day, things were changed. Things were different. It was a ritual in that sense. Halloween is a festival. It doesn't have that ritual element. Um, it has a festival. I mean, festivals can involve separation, a time out of time, and a reintegration, but the in-between time of the festival is usually temporary, what the anthropologist Victor Turner calls liminoid. In the case of a uh, uh, ritual, you have a liminal period. Victor Turner calls this a liminoid period because nothing changes. Things go back the way they were. At the end of the festival time, all returns to normal. During the festival, though, everyday rules may be suspended, reversed, or ignored. Um, my students often, uh, when we talk about this, will reference um, uh, the Disney uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame, right? Um, because they they haven't had a carnival celebration where the hunchback is wears the crown and is carried through the crowd and so forth. Because the person who was lowest in society for a day is lifted up to the highest. The roles are, are flipped. First or last, last or first. And the usual rules of, of life in certain aspects get suspended. People can behave in ways that they normally wouldn't behave. In the case of Halloween, right? next Tuesday, if um, a teenager comes to your house wearing a mask, and knocks on your door, you're likely to open the door and give them candy, right? December 5th, <laughs> a teenager at night comes to your house wearing a mask, knocks on your door, you're likely to call the cops, right? <laughs> Things have changed. And, 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 and it makes light of this, but there have been cases where there have been people who haven't understood uh, Halloween culture, recent immigrants to the United States who bad things have happened when, when people you know, don't know that this is a time when we can do this thing but only this time, right? You can't come in here with a mask on tomorrow because we're going to have you arrested. Um, that's the festival time. That's that's <laughs> just as a side note, um, the way these these things happen. So you're you're familiar with Mardi Gras, right? You're familiar probably with New Orleans Mardi Gras, and you're probably familiar with the tradition of how women uh, watching the parade will often get beads from the the parade. Groups, right? I don't have to give details. Right? There's a flashing that takes place, and if you flash the parade. Uh, somebody on the float will throw you throw you beats. And that's all well and good in New Orleans because that's their culture. Well, I went to graduate school in Lafayette, Louisiana, and Lafayette's Cajun country, and they have Mardi Gras. They have a very sort of almost medieval country Mardi Gras where it's almost like Halloween, where they go out on horseback and um, they start drinking at five o'clock in the morning. Uh, and they keep on all morning and they go to people's houses and they beg for chicken and rice and things for a gumbo and they play tricks and so forth. But the, the civic uh, organizations of Lafayette 
they celebrate Mardi Gras with a very traditional parade, not unlike Lancaster's Christmas parade or Mardi Gras parade, but not unlike Lancaster's Christmas parade, right? There are floats from the, uh, you know, the local real estate agent, the local beauty queen comes by, that sort of thing. It's not New Orleans. Well, one year when I was in grad school there, there were two women who came up from New Orleans and they were standing sort of off a little bit this way uh, from where my family and I were, or my wife and I were. And um, the parade starts coming down and these women had come from New Orleans. They start flashing the floats. Now, again, this would be like people flashing the Lancaster Christmas parade. <laughs> Within, I would say, four seconds, six or eight motorcycle cops surrounded me. <laughs> and it's, and I, was a, I was a folklore student at the time and just was like, yeah, that's it. That's local culture right there. You got to got to be aware of it. So certain times and places, the rules are suspended. And Halloween is is one of those. Halloween is a festival. Halloween has become a festival in that it is a time out of time, a special carnival left time when the rules of everyday life are set aside. Normally, you would tell your children, don't go bother strangers for candy. Right. Don't go from house to house begging for candy. It's dangerous for you. And it kind of makes us look bad, like we're not giving our kids candy. Uh, people wear masks in public without fear of arrest. Um, of course, pre-COVID, now, you know, different kind of mask. Um, it's okay to jump out of the bushes and wave a bloody, hat, uh, bloody hatchet at your neighbor on Halloween. Again, don't do that next Friday. <laughs> that will look very bad for you. But as I, as I started this off, um, there's there are threats to Halloween that, that had come up. Um, through the past, I, you know, for the past maybe 20, 30 years, but there there do seem to be these these um, interesting um, phenomena that, that seem to threaten the, the existence of, of Halloween or the celebration of Halloween. One, of course, um, and this is one that I, I, I grew up in you know, an hour from here. I grew up in the Bible Belt South, but I'd never heard this in, until recent years that Halloween is evil or Halloween is Satan's birthday, or it's a, a, a holiday um, that's satanic in its origins and practices. And I, I hope you, in this talk, you, you know, you've, you've learned, if you didn't know already, that it's not at all. It, it is a very Christian time. It is a very uh, Christian holiday. Um, but it's become associated with these, these things, um, as, the, as the little sticker there says. Uh, maybe, maybe Jesus threw you into hell for celebrating Halloween. Uh, concerns, perhaps obsessions, with children's safety. Razor blades and apples, poison candy, creepy neighbors, et cetera. A um, couple of things on this. I, don't, I hope they still don't do it. I do remember as a kid, you could take your candy to the uh, local hospital and get an x-ray. Um, I don't see how that was good. <laughs> it just didn't seem safe. Um, there was a, it's been a few years and it may have, might have changed, but um, but about 15 years ago, um, I remember reading a, a sociology study where two sociologists were interested in this story about uh, razor blades and apples, you know, candy that had been tampered with in one way or another. And so they went back uh, through, I think, 20 or 30 years of local newspaper articles from around October 29th to November 5th, right? So they just, they took, they took about a week and they uh, did a LexisNexis search, went through um, all of these newspaper articles to see how often it happened that candy was tampered with, that the candy was poison, razor blades were in apples, et cetera, et cetera. And over this 30, 40 year period, they found two cases, only two. Uh, and neither of those was what you would think. One was um, a little kid, little boy was trying to find, you know, uh, in my family, this happened. It, my mom would buy candy a, a week or so before Halloween, and then she'd have to hide it because we would eat it. If, if you got candy in the house, you're going to eat it. So this little boy was looking for um his uncle well he's looking for the halloween candy in the house so he was you know searching all through the house and he found a bag in his uncle's room of what i guess he thought was uh, um pixie stick dust or something like that it turned out to be heroin and he took a big handful of it and ended up having to go to the hospital for it he was that was not an intentional poisoning that was just a kid you know making it make it a dumb mistake um the other case was a father who was suffering from munchausen by proxy who had put rat poison in coincidentally pixie sticks giving them to his child so that he could take the child to the hospital, if you're familiar with this, this condition, you know, so that he would get intention. A family member doing this. So again, I mean, not saying that it doesn't happen, but how often it happens, is it something that people should really be that concerned about? Is it something where people should use x-rays to, to check on their candy? Probably not. The other uh, here, creepy neighbors, I 
I couldn't find the original article for this. Let me see if this will come up. I have to switch my screen. Well, I'm, no, I won't worry about it. Um, so several years ago, I just happened to come across this article. Um, it, it was on my, my news feed, but it was Anderson, South Carolina. So it was local and it was around Halloween. And it was an article about how the town of Anderson, uh, the sheriff's uh, or the, the uh, police chief was um, going out and, and requiring uh, any convic convicted pedophile to come to the police department and stay there from like five o'clock in the afternoon to midnight. So they had to stay there. So they gather up all the pedophiles in the community, put them in one room, stay here away from the kids, and they're going to go have Halloween. The thing that struck me about the article was it said that the the um, the uh, individuals would be provided with refreshments and entertainment, which is very disturbing. <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, and, and and again, you know, it's it's understandable that you send your kid your kid out into into a neighborhood to knock on strangers' doors. Um, but I don't know that there's anything in particularly uh, in particular about Halloween that makes this an even more dangerous time for for creepy neighbors. Uh, of course, terrorists, uh, particularly right after 9-11, um, there was a story that on Halloween, terrorists were going to attack a local shopping mall. Wherever you lived, that was the mall they were going to attack. Um, so far, hasn't happened, which is a good thing. Um, the general decline of the idea of neighborhoods and communities has has threatened Halloween. Um, you know, when I was a kid, we hit we trick-or-treated in our neighborhood. Occasionally, someone would drive us to the more affluent neighborhood and let us out, but we would still go door to door. Now, I was I was tongue-in-cheek uh, tongue uh, uh, joking with someone just the other day about how, how lazy our children are now that we put them in the cars and we drive them around and they do drive through trick-or-treating. But, but yeah, I, as a parent, I understand not wanting to have to walk that much. Uh, but that that has threatened a bit. We see that that we've gotten around it. We have trunk or treats. We have uh, Halloween um, uh, parties and and community events like we do here in Lancaster and so forth. Uh, and of course, the the other threat to Halloween uh, adults, um, particularly um, the sort of sexualizing of of Halloween. Right? You can you can go to the uh, Halloween store and any costume there is, it can be a sexy version. Right? A sexy. SpongeBob SquarePants, a sexy ghost, a whatever it might be. Um, because in many ways, it, it, while it wasn't originally a holiday for children, it, it has become really a, a holiday that that uh, we as adults have sort of turned over to children to to celebrate uh, and enjoy. So we'll finish up here just to talk a little bit about the function of Halloween in the in the contemporary world. Halloween is a carnivalous time, allowing us to break the rules safely and engage in play. And apparently as human beings, as communities, as cultures, we need these things. We need a time when we can let off steam. We need a time when we can have fun and we need a time to break the rules so we can remind ourselves what the rules are. We have a day when we put on masks and we act like someone else and we go around begging for food and we play tricks on people to remind us that 364 days of the year, we don't do this. We shouldn't do this. We're not, we can't do this. And our society won't work if we do this. Uh, it's an opportunity for personal creative expression, costumes, yard art, so forth. And as a folklorist, this is one of my favorite things about, about any holiday um, and just about people in general is the, the creativity of everyday people, right? People who you wouldn't think or, in, and I've said this when we talked about Christmas yard art as well, people that you wouldn't normally think of as artistic on a certain day for a certain holiday for a certain occasion, pull out all the stops. And they they, you know, we see the creativity of of everyday people in their costumes and their decorations and their their um um ways of celebrating the holiday. Uh, it's an opportunity to confront or even mock our greatest fears. And you think about sort of the appeal of horror movies, right? Horror movies allow you to experience the thrill of danger and fear, but in a safe place. Right. You can you can after an hour and a half, two hours, you get up, you leave, you go in your car and you face the real fears that are out in the world rather than you know, fears like like uh, bills that have to be paid and blood tests and things like that, rather than than uh, ghost faces and Jason's. But but you have that that brief period where you can safely confront those fears. And Halloween gives us that occasion. It's a day where we can we can be afraid. We can go to the haunted house uh, and and see you know local kids dressed up as zombies or whatever and, and enjoy it. It's an opportunity for parody and social critique. 
um, costumes that are the uh, mass of political leaders, um, for example, um, it's an occasion, this again, particularly for adults, an occasion when um, you can see costumes that make a social statement or a political statement. These are always, uh, you know, particularly clever uh, uh, costumes. And it's a celebration of life in the midst, in the midst of acknowledging death. Right. We can't have life without death. So on this holiday, when we think about the dead, the the, the undead, uh, the spirits, we also remember that we are alive. We are enjoying our life. We are celebrating our life. Maybe we're eating candy. Uh, maybe we're, we're having a party. We're bobbing for apples. And in the midst of a time when darkness is coming, right, October 31st, November 1st, darkness, the dark times are coming. We celebrate life. We look death in the face and we laugh at it. And I think that's a wonderful holiday.